Welcome to the WSJ Digital Network. I'm Wendy Bounds, and we're here to talk Super Bowl. So let's start at the beginning. If you don't follow football, but you just want a few talkie points to sound like you do, we've got a pigskin cheat sheet from WSJ's sports editor, Sam Walker. He was gentle. Not a football fan, but want to look like a real player while watching the Super Bowl? Here are some basic facts to toss around at any viewing party, especially if, like me, you're ready to bench that image as a total football fool. This year at Super Bowl XLVII, or 47 if your Roman numeral skills aren't up to par. Sorry, that's golf. Back to football. Obviously, it's key to know it's the Baltimore Ravens, not the Baltimore Falcons. And the 49ers are from San Francisco, not San Diego. And for the 10th time over its 47-year history, the Super Bowl is in New Orleans, a city usually associated with Mardi Gras. But beyond that, I don't know my punt from my pass. So I asked the Wall Street Journal sports editor, Sam Walker, what to say to sound smart around the cheese tray, or in my case, the crudité. First, the cream has finally risen to the top, and there are two really good teams facing off this time. Second, these teams may lack megawatt star power, but don't you dare call them boring. Baltimore QB Joe Flacco throws more deep balls with better results than any other quarterback in the NFL. On the other hand, the 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick loves to run, and fast. There's a reason he's been favorably compared to Usain Bolt. And third, this year's game could be renamed the Bro Bowl. 49ers coach Jim Harbaugh is going head-to-head -head against his older brother John, who just happens to be the coach of the Ravens. So who will win? Just think about Serena and Venus, Pedro and Ramon, Eli and Peyton, you get the idea. Sports history, and Sam, suggest that the youngest is usually more successful in cases of sibling rivalry. That would mean Jim's 49ers will take home the trophy. Now there's just one thing left to figure out. Is Beyonce singing or lip syncing during the halftime show? Uh, with that voice, who really cares? For the Wall Street Journal, this is Aaron Rasmussen. Now, let's talk TVs. Is there any such thing as one that is too big when it comes to the Super Bowl? Jason Bellini has the short answer. The weekend before the Super Bowl, I spotted this beauty at Costco, an 80-incher. And then there's this. Panasonic is now offering a 152-inch set for a mere half million dollars. Installation not included. It got me wondering, are living room TVs growing bigger than they really need to be? In terms of the visual experience, are we approaching the point of diminishing returns? Here's the short answer. There's a lot of scientific research on optimal screen size in terms of human physiology, but there's no consensus among video files on the perfect screen size to viewing distance ratio. Best Buy puts the optimal viewing distance at roughly 1.5 times the vertical length of the screen. The Consumer Electronics Association goes with two times the distance. Now, let's look at what people are actually buying out there. In 2011, nearly a million people bought screens larger than 60 inches. The CEA predicts that number will grow to 2.3 million people this year. At 60 inches, you should be, according to the CEA, 10 feet from the TV. Not as far as I thought. By 2015, the average TV size will be 40 inches, nearly double that of the late 90s, but still well below what most people can handle in terms of their living space, even someone like me living in New York. It turns out that 80-inch TV, if you can get just 13 feet away from it, could offer a superior immersive experience. The next generation of HD threatens to really give movie theaters a run for their money. The digital projectors used by AMC are 4,096 by 2160 lines of resolution, way higher than today's HD format, but new 4K HD sets will be approaching cinema-level resolution, making giant screens even crisper and shortening the distance you can sit from them and not see pixelation. So the short answer, it's not just showing off. In terms of TV size for watching the Super Bowl, most of us can and eventually will keep going bigger. Now, the Victor and Sunday's game takes home the coveted Vince Lombardi Trophy. We got a sneak peek at how this sterling silver prize from Tiffany is handcrafted each year. Check it out. We're standing today in Tiffany & Company's Hollowware shop in Parsippany, New Jersey. And this is where the Vince Lombardi Trophy comes to life.
Tiffany has been making the trophy uh, since the very first Super Bowl, and the trophy uh, stands about 22 inches high and weighs close to seven pounds, and it takes the craftspeople here at Tiffany approximately four months to build the trophy. Uh, it goes through several different stations of the uh, shop here. It starts off in the spinning area where flat pieces of silver are placed on a lathe and spun and formed to create the two halves of the football. The football is actually a regulation size NFL ball. Uh, the two halves of the ball are then brought together with a seamless soldering. The ball then move into the chasing area where an individual will, with a hammer and chisel, uh, create the seams of the ball. While that's taking place, uh, a silversmith is creating the laces and he's forming little pieces of silver and, and turning those into the laces. Those are then soldered onto the ball as well. The base of the trophy is formed from three sheets of flat sterling silver that are rolled and while that's happening, the shield is being made from yet another piece of silver uh, at another silversmith's bench. The shield will be applied to the base and then it'll move into our engraving department where an engraver will carve in the uh, Vince Lombardi trophy name as well as the Super Bowl date. I can't imagine a more important moment in the life of a professional athlete than being on the field in celebration of their championship. So uh, it's a real privilege for us to make this trophy, uh, arguably one of the most iconic trophies in sports. And we will all watch in anticipation of the conclusion of the game so that we can see this trophy make its way to the 50-yard line And finally, don't care a lick about football, cheerleaders, or ads? Hmm. Well, you can tune into the Puppy Bowl on Sunday on Animal Planet. Please note, there were no animals harmed during the filming of this segment, though we did have to uh, clean up after them. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you ready for some puppies? For most people, Super Bowl Sunday is about, well, football. And at $3.8 million a pop, the commercials are quite a draw, too. But let's face it, for millions of people, Super Bowl Sunday is all about the puppies. That's a big foul, excessive cuteness. It's Puppy Bowl 9 and we try to make things bigger and more exciting every year. This year, um, instead of our pig cheerleaders from last year, we've got hedgehog cheerleaders. And let me tell you something, trying to fit a hedgehog into a tutu is not an easy task. We had 63 puppies participate in this year's Puppy Bowl. They're from all over the country and they're all from rescue uh, centers, shelters, all available for adoption. And that's what we try to promote here is adoption awareness. Our kittens as well, 21 kittens as well that performed during the Kitty Halftime Show, all available for adoption as well. We've teamed up with PetFinder.com and they've done a great job of uh, hooking up pets with great homes. This year we had over 90 hours of footage after our uh, Puppy Bowl shoot, which was edited down into a two hour show. Um, that show of course premieres on Sunday, 3 to 5 p.m. on Animal Planet. We have cameras everywhere. In addition to our standard blimp cams and cameras in the stands, we have cameras literally embedded inside of the chew toy. So you can see the action from the point of view of a chew toy as it's dragged across the field. So you're not gonna miss anything on this year's Puppy Bowl. Thank you.